Our gospel message today comes from Luke's gospel, the 24th chapter. Very early in the morning on the first day of the week, the women went to the tomb, bringing the fragrant spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. They didn't know what to make of this, and suddenly two men were standing beside them in gleaming bright clothing, and the women were frightened, and they bowed their faces toward the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He isn't here, but has been raised. Remember what he told you while he was still in Galilee, that the human one must be handed over to sinners, be crucified, and on the third day arise again. Then they remembered his words. When they returned from the tomb, they reported all these things to the eleven and all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. Their words struck the apostles as nonsense, and they didn't believe the women. But Peter ran to the tomb, and when he bent over to look inside, he saw the linen cloth, and then he returned home, wondering what had happened. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. The story is told about a little girl who one day was complaining about having a bad stomach ache. She told her mom, Mom, my stomach really, really hurts. And her mom said, Oh, honey, you're just hungry. Your stomach is empty. So you just need to put something in it and you'll be fine. Well, about a week later, their pastor came by to visit with them. He was sitting on the couch with the mother and the little girl. And somewhere in the conversation, he made the comment, you know, I've got a really bad headache. And the little girl piped up and she said, oh, mommy says your head's just empty. If you put something in it, you'll feel better. Well, one of the reasons I think that story is funny is because to us, emptiness has a negative connotation. We don't want to be called empty-headed, do we? No. And we don't like it when the popcorn bowl is empty and we're watching a movie. We don't like it when our coffee cup is empty and we go to the coffee pot and it's empty too. And yet, there are so many things filled with emptiness in our world. Empty calories, empty rooms where we feel all alone. An empty, creaky old house after dark can make the hair on the back of your head stand up. Emptiness. We don't like empty wallets or empty bank accounts. Emptiness has a negative connotation. The empty shoes and the empty chair of a loved one who has gone to be with God saddens and breaks the heart. And with both joy and trepidation, many of us look toward that day when our children are gone and we experience empty nest. But that emptiness is quickly filled so often with fear and with worry about what's going to happen with our children, and it weighs us down. For the most part, Emptiness has a negative connotation. And yet we gather here and sanctuaries all around the world are packed with people to celebrate an empty tomb. It's kind of odd, isn't it? That we celebrate the gift of emptiness. Someone has once said that we celebrate because while the tomb is empty, the promises of Jesus are not empty. And so that's what we really celebrate. The gospel tells us that it was the crack of dawn when the woman arrived at the tomb on that Easter morning. They were sleepy 
and shell-shocked from all that had happened in the hours before that morning. They made the way, their way to that place where they had laid Jesus' body in a borrowed tomb. Surely they were tired as they made their way there. For the Sabbath, the day of rest in the Jewish culture, was never really all that restful for women. They had to prepare food ahead of time for the family to serve their household and any Sabbath guests that they might have. But the children still needed to be tended to on the Sabbath day. The animals needed to be cared for on the Sabbath day. And the women knew that on this day, they had to get to the tomb early. So they had to have those spices prepared, prepared to anoint Jesus's body, his body that had already been in the tomb throughout that day. And they knew if they did not get there before noon, the heat of the sun would cause the stench of his body to be unbearable. The spices they carried with them were to mask the smell of death. Those smells that would have been there on this third day. And so that third day starts with exhaustion, not to mention all of the emotional upheaval that those women felt that day. They are looking forward to nothing but Jesus' dead, cold, smelly body. There's nothing more that they feel like they can do for Jesus other than give him a proper burial. The dispirited followers of Jesus were fraught with feelings of despair as that first Easter morning dawned. The weekend of terror had left them traumatized and hopeless. They did not remember that Jesus had foretold his resurrection. Or maybe they were just too overwhelmed with their exhaustion and their sadness to remember Jesus' words. He had died and that was that as far as they could see. My hunch is that each and every one of us can understand what those women felt that day. Each and every one of us has experienced third days like that in our lives. Experiences and moments and sometimes years when it appears that the grief and the put your head down and your nose to the grindstone kind of life just will never end. Times when in frustration and discouragement and dejection, you're ready to give up. Times when nothing good seems to happen in our lives and we question if anything good will ever happen again in our lives. And the question that comes to many of our hearts and minds in times like that is, is there a good word from the Lord for us? Is there some good news for us in the midst of the struggles of life? Some of us just really want to be a better Christian. We want to be stronger in our faith and bolder in our faith. But the afflictions of sickness and disease and medical hardships are difficult for us, especially when the field of medicine seems to have no cure. They just treat the symptoms. I know that among us today, there are young couples who want to have children, and yet they continue to rock empty cradles, and the heartache is real. There are married people who are struggling in their special relationship together, trying to build a happy home, but not knowing how, as they struggle with one another. There are people struggling with moral dilemmas. And there are people who are battling addictions. There are people who want work but can't find a job. There are people who are struggling to hold on to retirement. And there are people who are struggling against the power of failure and disappointments, roadblocks, and detours in their life. Seems like no matter where we turn, there are difficulties in this world. So when I read this scripture about Easter, I identify with those women and how they felt on that third day. The disillusionment, the disappointment, 
And yet those angels meet them in the tomb and ask them an interesting question. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? See, they expected no new life after all of that darkness. And yet Jesus promises us new light. At Christmas, we celebrate the fact that Jesus is the light of the world. And we are told in the Gospel of John, as it opens, that the darkness can never overcome the light of Christ. On that dark morning, these women needed to be reminded of the light of Christ. Pastor Pat Barnes tells a story. On a beautiful spring day, he had a sense of peace as he left the church on a Monday morning after Easter. He said he paused for a moment at the steps of the church leading into the streets of the city. And he noticed the woman sitting there in her usual spot under an archway. She had before her beautiful flowers, bouquets and corsages and boutonnieres laid out on a piece of newspaper. The lady was smiling. Her wrinkled face was alive with inner joy. Pastor Barnes started down the steps of the church, and on impulse, he decided to stop, and he he picked up a flower, and he looked at the woman as he paid for the flower, and he said to her, you look so happy. And she said, well, why not? Everything is good. He looked at her again. She was dressed in shabby clothes. She seemed so very old. She seemed to not have much money or means in her life. You've been sitting here for many years, he said, haven't you? And every time I see you, you're smiling. You're always smiling. You wear your troubles so well. And the lady responded, You can't reach my age and not have troubles. Only it's like Jesus and Good Friday. And then she paused. Yes, the pastor said to prod her on. Well, when Jesus was crucified on Good Friday, that was the worst day for the whole world. When I get troubles, I remember that. And then I think, about what happened only three days later. Easter and the Lord arising. So when things go wrong, I've learned to wait three days and everything will get better. With that, Pastor Barnes said the old lady smiled goodbye to him and turned to help another person buy some flowers. He walked away into the busyness of his day But he writes that those words of that flower lady follow him. Whenever he thinks he has troubles, he remembers her words. And he says to himself, let me give God a chance to help. I just need to wait three days. My friends, all of us go through difficult times in life. And we need to be reminded like those women at the tomb that day of the promises of Jesus, promises that the light will never be totally extinguished, promises that there is life beyond defeat, promises that there is life beyond despair, and promises that there is life beyond death. You know, Jesus said, as is quoted at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, Remember, I am with you always, even into the end of the age. And that reminds us that we never have to face life alone. Jesus is always there with us to face those difficulties in life. And knowing that Jesus is alive can give us the confidence to face whatever difficulties come to us in life. Here's a story about a little girl named Becky. Becky was born with birth defects. Her faith helped her family, her entire family, through some very difficult times in her life. By the time Becky was four years old, she had already had multiple surgeries. Becky was in the hospital 
recovering from yet another surgery when she was six years old. And there was an eight-year-old girl who was wheeled into the room right next to Becky. That eight-year-old girl was scheduled for brain surgery, and she was very frightened. She began to cry, and she became so emotional and hysterical that no one seemed to be able to comfort her and quiet her down. Her parents tried, the nurses tried, the doctors tried, but nobody could help her calm down. Becky, Becky sat there, quite serious. Then she turned to her mother and she said, I know what to do. She climbed off of her bed and she walked over to the other little girl's bedside. She climbed up beside the little girl and she put her hand on the little girl's cheek. And she said to the little girl, I know how you feel. I used to be afraid too, but I'm not anymore. And the little girl was still quietly crying as Becky continued to just stroke her cheek. The other little girl looked Becky in the eyes and asked her, well, why aren't you afraid anymore? Because I have Jesus, Becky said. No one has to be afraid anymore when they have my Jesus. And then Becky did something very special for that little girl. She raised up both of her hands to her heart. And she lifted up her hands as if they were a cup scooping up something out of her heart. And she reached over to the other little girl and she said to her, Here, open your hands for me. And the little girl opened up her hands. And Becky transferred her most treasured possession to that little girl. She said, Here, take my Jesus. With my Jesus, you will never have to be afraid again. Jesus will never leave you. From the mouths of little children, my friends, we receive the good news of Easter. We are called as resurrection people to share that peace and that love, that hope that we find in Jesus. The resurrected Lord will give us the confidence to face all of the circumstances we face in our lives. And He will give us the grace and the courage we need to share that light and that love and that peace with others like Becky did. A pastor friend of mine shared with me a poem several years ago that illustrates how we are to carry on. Here's his poem. Two frogs fell into a deep cream bowl. One was an optimistic soul, but the other took the gloomy view. I shall drown, he cried, and so will you. So with a last despairing cry, he closed his eyes and said goodbye. But the other frog, with a merry grin, said, I can't get out, but I won't give in. I'll swim around till my strength is spent. For having tried, I'll die content. And bravely he swam until it would seem his struggles began to churn the cream. On the top of the butter, at last he stopped, and out of the bowl, he happily hopped. Well, the moral of the story, my friends, is easily found. If you can't get out, keep swimming around. The third day will come, my friends, if we do not give up. Jesus has said he will never leave us alone and he will give us the strength to face the new tomorrows that come our way. Evangelist Tony Campolo told about a Good Friday service that he attended several years ago, and he was asked to be one of the seven preachers to preach on the seven last words of Christ. He described it as a dynamic and moving meeting. He said he did a pretty good sermon himself, he thought, and the other preachers congratulated him and had appropriate amens and preach it brothers for him. Many of the other preachers were African-American pastors, and they responded to sermons verbally like that. One pastor, the host pastor, said to him, Well done, son. 
Now watch this. And that pastor got up. And Tony Campolo says his sermon was nothing less than extraordinary. He kept repeating over and over again the phrase, It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. It's Friday, and all the pain you feel is real. The horror is real, but Sunday's coming. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming, and we will prevail if we keep the faith and the openness of Jesus Christ. If the power of Jesus is the power of the resurrection at work in our lives, we need to remember the promises of Jesus are real. Several years ago, a reporter came and asked a preacher what his Sunday sermon was going to be about on Easter. And he said, well, it's going to be about God and it's going to be about 20 minutes long. And the reporter said, well, yeah, but what are you going to tell the people? And the pastor said, I'm going to ask the people to trade their heartache for hope, their faith for fear, their bewilderment for belief, and their duty for delight. And the reporter paused and he said, well, that sounds very nice, but, but how can people do that? And the preacher replied, if God has the power to raise Jesus from the dead, can God not also empower us? to be released from whatever it is that holds us down and entombs us. My friends, the good news of Easter is simple. The tomb is empty, but the promises of God are not. May we have the strength, the courage, and the faith to believe, to trust, and to remember the promises of God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen and amen.